Shalom, beloveds of the King. Praise Abba Yahuwah. That we can come before him today as we are continuing with our Torah portions and how exciting as we just continue to be able to look at the word in a deeper way in this critical hour and time that we find ourselves in in terms of where the world is heading to. And truly, when the Father said, we are entering into a new era, I don't think he was uh, he was playing games. I think he knew exactly what he was saying when he said at Yom Teruah that we are entering into a new era. And this is the new era of what we find ourselves in. in. Is this going to be the new era? It's going to be the beginning of the darkest days, the darkest hour that we are facing in this time. As we see war, and it's not rumors of war now, but war. And the only thing is, is this war going to escalate? To become bigger than what it is right now. But we praise the Father that we can turn our gaze on him. And so that when the Bible says that when you see all these things, that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, the end is not yet. It's the beginning of the birth pains. So we are really at the time where I would say that the birth pains now are at the place of where the contractions are extremely one after the other, where truly we are about to give birth to the things that has been spoken in the word. And we are about to see great great evil. I don't think that we've yet understood the great evil that is about to come upon the earth. But we praise Abba that we find ourselves in an hour now where we can draw our attention to him because we can take courage from Psalm 121 that says, lift up your heads to the hills. Where does your help come from? Your help comes from Yahuwah, the creator of heaven and earth. The sun shall not smite you by day nor the moon by night. And so we can take courage in that. So let us pray as we start this Torah portion. Abi Yahuam, I just want to praise you and I just want to thank you for this day, my Father. I thank you for everything that you are doing in our lives in this hour. And I thank you, Father, that we truly understand that when all these things start to happen around us, then we know that our redemption draws near. Then we know that our bridegroom is at the door, then we know that our bridegroom is soon to return. And so what does the bride have to do when she knows that she's about to get ready for a wedding? She's excited. She's making sure that the wedding is, all the wedding preparations need to be ready. Is her dress ready? Is her shoes ready? Does she have the veil? Does she have everything that she needs? to be able to be put in place. But most importantly, the excitement in her heart that the day that she dreamt about, the day that she's prepared for, the day that she has gone and she's just prepared herself and has had eyes for nothing, gaze for nothing, focus on nothing else than her bridegroom and the day of that wedding. And so, Abba Yahuwah, I thank you that as we turn our gaze on to you, that you will not disappoint us, that you will come and fill us to overflowing with your presence. Thank you, Father, that as we come to you and we come to study this Torah portion, and that with every Torah portion that we're busy studying at the moment, that you would open up the eyes of our understanding, that you would open up our hearts to be able to understand the deeper revelation of what you want to show us in this hour, in terms of us being able to be studying this this Torah portion at this critical hour where we find ourselves right now. So, Abiyahua, I just want to thank you. I thank you 
for your insight. And I thank you, Father, for where we can just bring every situation around the world, we can bring it to you. And we know that you are faithful and just to keep that which we give to you. Father, will you undertake in the situation? You know exactly what is going on, where people are mourning, where people are crying out to you for loved ones that are that are abducted, that are being taken captive. You know every situation. And I thank you, Father, that you are the only one that can intervene in the atrocities of what we see go on around us, of the death and destruction that we see. And truly the devil comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But you have come to give us life and life in abundance. And I pray that this be a time now where more than ever that people would start to have visions and dreams of who you are, that you alone will reveal yourself to people that are crying out to you in this hour all over the world, that you reveal yourself because you are the only Prince of Peace. There's never going to be peace on this earth until the Prince of Peace dwells in our hearts. So we want to welcome the Prince of Peace in our midst and we want to ask him to come and have his way. And so I thank you, Father, that you speak to my mind and speak through my lips the very oracles that will come from you, that I will not speak my words or my thoughts, but that I would speak with your authority and power and that it will be to the glory and the honor of your name. In Yeshua's name I pray this. <clears throat> Amen. So praise Abba Yahuwah. We are looking at Parasha Metzorah. And Parasha Metzorah is the one with Sarat. The one with Sarat. And that Sarat means the one, the one that is being diseased. So the one that has a disease. The one that has a disease in its body. And so the Sarat is what we would understand in that time as being leprosy. But today, this leprosy could present itself in a different way. Today, leprosy could represent itself in a, in a different way, could represent itself in a different sickness. Um, and so, This is a time now where we're looking at this Torah portion and having to understand what is the Father trying to show us in this hour from this Torah portion. Because the thing is that, you know what, truly, 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 uh, there is no way that I'm taking these hours that I have to take in order to be able to sit down and study these Torah portions because I've got to get tick off a little a little calendar and say, wow, I read the Torah portion for this week um, and, you know, I've had a little bit of insight into it and I've just done like a, a little ritual thing because I was told long time ago that that is not the way the Father works with me. And so if I'm working through these cycles, it's certainly not because I've just got to do a Torah portion because it's what is commanded because it's not commanded. And so... It doesn't tell me that I have to. Yes, it tells me that I'm to meditate on his Torah, on his word, day and night. But the reason that we are working through this Torah cycle now, and Father has put us onto this Torah cycle, not in when the rest of the world is now doing the Torah cycles, as they are doing a Torah cycle according to a rabbinical, a rabbinical calendar, and they're doing it according to Judaism. They're doing it according to um, a Babylonian system where they have got the system that came out of Babylon where they start the new year, which is in the seventh month. And that tells us it's the seventh month. That no one yet tells us it's the new month. And we know that our calendar starts in March. And so from March, we have been studying the Torah portions and looking at this Torah portion from the beginning to be able to understand the seasons and the times according to Abba Yahuwah's calendar and not according to our own. And so 
If you may be joining for the first time and you're thinking, what on earth is she doing? We have now just started, you know, we've passed Genesis, we've passed Noah, and um, they're now carrying on with the new Torah cycle of um, this, you know, starting the the new year that really started at um that they say starts at Yom Teruah, which is not Yom Teruah, it's the seventh month, and nowhere there does it tell you that it's a new year. It doesn't tell you that it's Rosh Hashanah. That word is not there at all. It says it's Yom Teruah. And so in obedience, I'm just doing what the Father has asked me to do. And so today we are going to look at Metzorah. And I'm really going to continue because these two Torah cycles of Metzorah and the one that I've just done, which is Zaria, Tazaria, the Torah cycle of Tazaria and Metzora is really just, it's, it's really combined. Normally they read them together. In a lot of the Torah cycles, they will read them together. And, um, and so it really just carries on with where we were looking at the laws of clean and unclean in one's body. What does the Father deem as clean? What does the Father deem as unclean? And so we had a look um, at clean and unclean, Tahor and Tamay. And this is really the, 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 the Torah portions of where we're really looking at what the Father sees in the body as being clean and unclean. And so therefore we're continuing to look and we looked at the previous Torah portion, and we were looking at leprosy, which is Tassara. And then we had a look at numbers where we had a look at Moses, where Miriam and Aaron are having a conversation, speaking up against Moshe and the woman, a Kushite woman that he has now married. And they were not approving of this. And so they made their, themselves um, audible to one another to speak up against Moshe. Now, it was one thing to speak up against Moshe, but it's another thing to turn around and say, well, he's not the only one who hears from the Father. So you see, generally, when you want to speak up against someone else, there is going to come a level of jealousy that is within you, that is causing you, or it's either jealousy or envy, that is going to come up in your heart against that person, because at the end of the day, it's issues that you're going on within yourself. So, to a certain extent, by the things that they are discussing, you can see that there is a jealousy to say, well, he's not the only one who hears from the Father. Look and see how he uses you as well, Aaron. So he's not the only one who's hearing from Yahuwah. And that's why the Father says, is there no fear? Is there no fear for Yahuwah to understand that Moshe is not even like the prophets? The prophets he speaks to in visions and dreams. But to Moshe, he doesn't speak in visions and dreams. He speaks to him face to face. He speaks to him by his mouth. So there are those that, a lot of prophets that would be able to get more visions and dreams. But then there are prophets that, they hear the Father. The Father speaks to them as he would to a man face to face. They hear his voice so clearly and they walk with him. And Father speaks to them because they are his leaders. They are those that are not just prophetic voices. They are those that the Father is raising up in this hour to be able to really come and set the captives free. And so we should all be able to get into a place of where we understand that that is a mandate that the Father has given us. And that we should have intimacy with our Father. And therefore we should understand that we've got to be very careful in what we speak. And this is what we're going to look at today. We are going to look at this continuing of the evil speaking. Because it's not what goes into the mouth that makes us unclean. But what comes out of the mouth that makes us unclean. And that is why it is so important that we are to look at this. Because when we look at this. We understand what the Father is trying to say to us in terms of the fulfillment of this leprosy that he's speaking. This is the laws 
of what's clean and what is unclean. And that is what we need to understand. And so what is the Father trying to tell us in the hour that we are living in today, in this time, in this very hour that we find ourselves in? What is the Father trying to tell us in this hour? Because this is a critical hour. And therefore, we have an obligation to not just be saved. We have an obligation that we didn't just receive salvation. We have an obligation that once we receive salvation, we are supposed to be changed from glory to glory. And therefore, we are supposed to be on a process of being cleaned up, to be presented before the Father as a holy vessel, as a set-apart vessel. So we should be walking out a purpose and a plan of more set-apartness. This is what the Father wants. He says, be holy as I'm holy. Be set apart as I'm set apart. So we should be coming through, we should be coming to a time of where we are supposed to be tahor, clean, pure, morally, ethically, to be able to be physically, morally, to become bright. It's the word for tahor, which is the word for clean. So we need to clean up what is not pleasing to the Father in our lives. And so we are going to look a little bit at exactly what the Father is trying to say because it was by Miriam's mouth speaking that she then got leprosy on her body. We saw even in the half Torah of um, last the, the last Torah portion with um, Naaman, 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 that um, what was the problem that was there? It was the fact that it was his attitude. He had a critical, judgmental attitude. His heart was wicked. And there was arrogance and pride that dwelt within him. And there was an, a critical, judgmental spirit. There are people that everything that they speak out of their mouths is just critical and judgmental. They cannot speak anything good. It doesn't matter. The cup will always be half empty. It will never be half full. It's always going to be half empty. Because no matter what the circumstances, they only see the critical side of everything. They only see the evil side of everything because their mouths only know how to speak criticism. And therefore, they have wrath within them. They have anger within them. And there's pride that is within them. And so, this is what Naaman had when the prophet had told him that he was to be able, the, the prophet told him what he was to do. But in his own arrogance and pride, he wouldn't listen. And he wanted an easy solution, an easy way out. And once again, today we are going to understand that the Father will speak through the prophets. But many times the people don't take the words of the prophets to heart. Because today, one of the most, one of the most, I would say, almost like defiled offices of the fivefold ministry is the office of the prophet. Because today, people don't even know a true prophet from a false prophet. Because the false prophets is what they would prefer to listen to. That when a true prophet speaks, they don't know how to discern. Because they've been handed over to a reprobate mind of only listening to the sugar-coated words that come out of these false prophets that tickle people's ears but are not setting people free. And that is why the Father wants us to be able to look at this in more detail in terms of what happens with our tongue. What is it that we do with our mouths? And so that we may be able to um, understand that there's consequences to what we speak. So, we look at Leviticus chapter 14 and we just read from verses one, from verse one to four so that we just get the beginning of it. And it says, and Yahuwah spoke to Moshe saying, this shall be the Torah. So this will be the, 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 
ordinances. This is going to be the, the laws of the leper. So the laws of the diseased. The leprous is the disease, which is the tsarot. So it's the one with tsarot. And this is metsora. It's the one with tsarot. And metsora means the one that is being diseased. And this shall be the Torah of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest. So you see, the priest was the one that had to be able to judge between whether he's going to be clean or whether he's going to be unclean. So there was a judge, a judging that was having to be done by the priests because the priests were the ones that had to judge what's right and what's wrong. And, and this is where it's so sad today because where are the father's priests that can really discern what's right from what's wrong? Where are the father's priests in this hour that are being able to speak and see where the right rulings are in order to be able to speak and say, you know what, that is out of order. That is not in the Father's will and that's not in the Father's way. That is out of order. And to be able to speak and speak the truth and bring correction because this is the problem you see. Most of the false prophets, all they want is a following and they want to be popular and they want to be admired and they want people to, to really like them for the nice sugar-coated words that they speak. And so they have these big followings. But you see, the true prophets, they are the ones that are having to speak the word that is going to be a straight word that offends. And that generally when the prophet speaks, it will offend. A lot of times it will offend if your heart is not right. But if your heart is right, it will be soothing words to your life in order to come and set you free. Because at the end of the day, that is why the Father is speaking through the prophet to be able to come and help people to be set free. So, we read and it says, And the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look and see if the leprosy is healed in the leper. Then the priest shall command, and he shall take for him who is to be cleansed, two live and clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command and he shall slay one of the birds in the earthen vessel over the running water. Let him take the, 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 live, the live bird and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was slain over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the live bird loose in the open field. So you see, it was the priest's job to make sure that he could come and cleanse the, the, the leper that was now, that was unclean, that through the, through the father was going to work through the priest in order to bring cleansing. So this makes a lot of sense because in the day and age, especially with a lot of the work that the Father gets Elsie and I to go out to do, many times it's to be able to uproot and replant, uproot that which is not of him and to replant that which is of him and to repent on behalf of the sin of the land and to be able to break the curse of that which is on the land and then to be able to bring the Father's um blessing upon the place to uproot and then to replant and this was what was already being done through the priests even if there was bloodshed on the ground the police the priest would have to go to be able to bring a cleansing and we are going to see that in the next few torah portions ahead we will understand that this is what the priest would have to do and he who is to be cleansed shall wash his garments and shall shave off all his hair and wash himself in water and shall be clean. Then after that he comes into the camp, 
but shall stay outside his tent seven days. And on the seventh day it shall be that he shaves all the hair off his head and his beard and his eyebrows, even all his hair he shaves off, and he shall wash his garments and wash his body in water and shall be clean. And so here we are seeing that there's got to be a cleansing process. And so for us to be able to return back into um, the camp with the Father, we need to go through a cleansing process because we ourselves are leprous. Our hearts are leprous. Our mouths. And, and we need to be cleansed. And that's why the Father takes us through this cleansing process that even in Exodus chapter 19 verses 10 and 11, I'm not going to go there. In 10 and 11, he tells them to wash their robes to set themselves apart to Yahuwah. So they had to come and wash their robes so that they could come and stand before Yahuwah in order to receive his commands. And so the same as these lepers would have to wash themselves, be cleansed, be purified, before they can be allowed to be let, let back into the camp. And so this is why if we were to treat things properly, when people start to speak slanderous things, and they start to be able to want to break down Abba Yahuwah's ministry and the work that the Father's doing. Because generally what happens is the minute that the, per, the, minute that the, that the Father raises up a person and the, the person is doing the Father's work, there will always be the critics out there that are going to try and break down the work of the Father by being able to come and criticize and judge that which is being done of the Father. And it's always amazing because the people that have a lot to say are the very people that themselves are not doing anything. But they will come up against and criticize the ones that are trying to do something for the Father. Because that's generally the way it works. Because the devil will always want to come and shut the mouth of the ones that are trying to do the work of the Father in order to come and set the captives free. And this is what we've got to understand. That right now, truth needs to go forth. But the enemy will do everything in its power in order to be able to come and stop that. And that's why we read in Matthew chapter 18 that we went and we read that scripture in Matthew chapter 18 that if there is, if your brother has done something to, to, harm you or to offend you or whatever, you go to your brother and you sort it out with your brother so that there is no no reason for there being a problem in the camp. If your brother still doesn't want to receive it, that that's when you take the you take people with you as witnesses. And if they still don't want to listen, then that is when you're going to bring them before the congregation. And you are going to say to the congregation these people need to be removed for a period of time until they come to repentance because their hearts are hard. Their hearts are hard and they don't want to forgive and they don't want to release and they want to stay in their critical judgmental attitude and they will do more harm with their mouths against the the, the 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 church or against the fellowship or against a congregation or whatever it is and this is why we start we have to learn to be able to take when a person's mouth is not going if it's going to keep wanting to destroy the work of the father then it needs to be silenced because it's doing more damage than it's doing good and so that's why Um, we are going to look at the word Lashonara. So Lashonara, Lashon is basically, Lashon is the picture, the picture of Lashon is a tongue. So Lashon is the word that is the picture of Hebrew for the tongue. And then it's Lashon Hara, and Hara is evil. Ra is evil. So it's an evil tongue. An evil tongue that speaks. So when our tongue speaks evil, what do we get on our bodies? 
What do we get in return? Because understand, what you sow with your mouth is what you're going to re reap in return. Because your mouth cannot keep sowing evil that you're not going to reap from it. It's our evil tongue that causes us to be unclean. And how many afflictions do we get in our body from our own evil tongue? So, if we look at Leviticus 14, verses 14, it says, And the priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering, and the priest shall put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of the right hand, on the big toe of his right foot. And the priest shall take some of the log of oil, and pour it into the palm of his own left hand. And the priest shall be shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand and shall be and shall sprinkle some of the oil with his finger seven times before Yahuwah. And it's interesting that even um for seven days, I mean they had to sprinkle that um bird with the, the blood seven times. And yeah they had to sprinkle the seven times. Interesting how Na Naaman had to go into the water seven times to cleanse himself. So he had to be, Naham had to be cleansed seven times. And so he had to go through the cleansing process. And so if we have a look and we see here, this is very much the reflection of what our Messiah has done for us. Because the priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering and the priest shall put it on the tip of his right ear. Now, when Yeshua put the crown of thorns, when the crown of thorns was put on his head, it came and it dripped onto his ears. It came and dripped over his eyes, over his nose, over his mouth, basically cleansing his senses, his ears, his eyes, his nose, his mouth, all the senses our senses was redeemed by the blood of Yeshua so that when we put on the armor, we can protect our eyes, we can protect our nose, our mouth, our ears, our mind. And that's that crown of thorns came to redeem. So he would have to sprinkle the blood on the ear and the crown of thorns covered the ear. Then he had to be able to take a, 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 to take a tip of it and cleanse and on the thumb of the right hand. So when he was nailed at the stake, the blood would have run onto the thumbs by the fact that he was crucified when he was impaled, where they say it wasn't quite, if it was in the middle of the hands, then it would have been through the bones, because remember there was no bones that was broken. A lot of people say that it was by the wrist. But whichever way it was there, it would have run onto the thumb. And so that dripping of the blood would have been the dripping on the blood on the thumb. And then on the toe. And then Yoshua was crucified with his feet together. And that blood would have run onto his toes. So once again, he himself became the perfect offering for our diseased bodies to be able to clean us from all the diseases that is already out there. And he came to heal and cleanse every leper, that he became the perfect sacrifice to be able to come and cleanse the body of any leprous person. And so, if we go look at Matthew chapter 15, we are going to now look and see in the renewed covenant, the renewed covenant that the Father has given, in this renewed covenant, um, we are going to have a look at um, Matthew chapter 15 to understand what now defiles our body. Because remember, the leprosy would make us unclean. Now we're going to see what is it that is going to make us unclean. So we are going to read Matthew chapter 15, 
from verse 8. And this is really when um, when the Pharisees came to Yeshua and, he, and they said in verse 2, Why do your taught ones transgress the traditions of the elders? Remember, not the law, but the traditions of the elders. For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. So the tradition was that you are to wash your hands before you eat your bread. That's a custom and a tradition. It's not a law. And so he turned around and he said to them in verse 3, but he answering said to them, why do you also transgress the command of Allah because of your tradition? So he's talking to them. It's about their traditions. And so in verse 6 he says, it's certainly released from is is certainly released from respecting his father and mother. So you have nullified the command of Allah by your traditions. He says in verse 7, Hypocrites, Yeshiyahu right, rightly prophesied about you, saying, This people draw near to me with their mouth and respect me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So you see, the mouth can even be used for good in order to be worshipping and praising the Father and speaking all the right things out of the Father, for the Father, about the Father. So they can spend all their lives speaking about the Father, but yet their hearts are wicked. So you must understand, it doesn't matter how much you read your Bible. It doesn't matter even how much you know your Bible. It doesn't matter how much you, you speak about the Father. It doesn't matter how much you can preach about the Father. But at the end of the day, Father looks at the heart. Because you can speak all the right things. You can believe all the right things. You can say all the right things. But at the end of the day, the heart is the wicked thing. And eventually out of the heart, the mouth eventually is going to speak. So it will be a split tongue. Because it's going to be a tongue that on the one hand, can say all the right things about the Father. But on the next hand, it's going to bring the wicked and the evil that's going to come out of it. So let's listen to what he says. These people draw near to me with their mouths. So on the one hand, they would be praising the Father. But the minute that they didn't have any food they or any water, they would start to curse Moshe. They would start to curse the Father. And they would start to speak things like, did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us? And then they would start to criticize and they would start to judge. And there's something that the father doesn't want and that is criticism because this is the one thing that the Israelites kept doing. They kept criticizing the whole time. So did he bring us out of Egypt just to be able to kill us in the wilderness so that we may die of starvation, so that we may die of not having something to drink? And now we don't even have meat. And so it was constantly complaining, 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 criticizing Moses and complaining constantly. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as the teachings the commands of men. So you see, you can even teach the commands of men. And calling the crowd near, he said to them, Hear and understand. Not that which goes into the mouth defiles the man, but that which comes out of the mouth, this defiles the man. So it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man. It's what's going to come out of the mouth that's going to defile a man. So they were complaining because the Israelites didn't eat with washed hands. They had not washed their hands. So a lot of people like to bring the scripture and then they want to make all foods clean because he didn't say it's not what goes into the mouth that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of the mouth that makes you unclean. Beloveds of the king, the, read always from the beginning. It's the same as that, that um, sheet that comes down in Acts chapter 10. It's not talking about the animals being made clean. It's talking about his building a, 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 a whole, um, uh, uh, He's laying a foundation there to be able to tell, um, he's, he's busy speaking to Peter and telling Peter that 
the Gentiles were not to be called unclean. Now he's not making foods clean. He's saying to eat with unclean hands is not going to defile you. It's not making the food clean. If he's told you that that food is unclean, nothing that you're going to do, a little magic potion, is going to be able to all of a sudden make a pig that has an instinct to eat everything that is unclean to all of a sudden make it clean. It's not going to just chew grass. When it's in its whole molecular structure, it has been structured to eat what is unclean because that's how the Father made it. And that's the way the Father made it. And that's why the Father told us not to eat it. It's that simple. He didn't all of a sudden Yeshua come and say, well, now the pig is all clean. All meat is now clean. Everything is clean. You can just eat clean because it's not what goes into the mouth that makes you unclean, but it's what comes out of the mouth that makes you unclean. This is not what the conversation is about. And calling the crowd near, he said, hear and understand. Not that which goes into the mouth defiles the man, but that which comes out of the mouth, that defiles the man. Then his taught ones came to him and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees stumbled when they heard this word? So you see, the people are going to get offended when you're going to speak the truth. And so did they get upset with Yeshua when he spoke the truth. They stumbled. It's like, we don't like what he just said now. But he answering said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be uprooted. Well, if that's not exactly the prophetic word that the Father is giving for the season that we are in. That was the very word that the Father spoke at the beginning of Sukkot when he said, every plant that has not been planted by him, everything that's not been planted by him, he's going to start uprooting. He's going to shake and he's going to uproot. Leave them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both fall into a ditch. And Kepha answering said to him, Explain this parable to us. And Yoshua said, Are you also still without understanding? So do you see, what is it that the Father requires of us to be able to have about the word? We need to have the understanding of the word. It doesn't just help us to be able to read the word. We need to have the deeper understanding and revelation of the word. Now there's many people studying the word and studying the word and studying the word to be able to require understanding. Understanding doesn't come just because you're studying it and studying it and studying it. Understanding is only going to come by the revelation that comes from the Father, which comes from the Ruach of Yahuwah. And it's not going to come from all your amount of studying it. That's why you can study something now and then it comes two months, three months down the line. You will not remember anything that you studied because it was just all work of the flesh. But it wasn't a lasting work that came from him where he is the one opening up and giving you the revelation. And so he says, do you not understand that whatever enters into the mouth goes into the stomach and it casts out in the sewer. But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And that is what we spoke. You see, understanding that which you think in your mind is going to eventually filter into your heart, which is going to eventually speak out of your mouth, which is eventually going to become the destiny because you will curse yourself with your own mouth. And he says, but what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart and these defile the man. For out of the heart comes forth wicked reasonings, murders, adulteries, whorings, thefts, false witnessing, slanders. These defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So do we understand this is what defiles us. It's the wicked reasoning of our flesh man. Our mind, our will, our emotions. We reason things in our mind. We commit murder. How do we murder? We murder with our lips when we are going to be able to break down someone's character or something about somebody where we would just 
speak bad about somebody because we got offended with somebody. And now because of our own offense, we are going to slander another person. Because if we really go down to the root of it, the person that's going to slander another person, it's only because they are offended by something that that person has said. And so that is why we need to be able to understand that we need to be able to get our hearts right and we need to be able to forgive so that we do not slander. And so slander, now listen to what slander is. To communicate, to defame, to damage another's reputation, to gossip and rumor. You will gossip about a person because you have unforgiveness. And when you love to hear the rumor about another person, it is because you have unforgiveness and it is, sp and it is spreading over you. You find yourself talking down about the person who wounded you and you are glad when you hear that they are suffering. You misread the other person's motives all the time, even when the other person does nothing. You can't trust them and you tell other people not to trust them. You will gossip about them. How much gossip happens? A lot. How much unforgiveness is done? A lot. When a person is gossiping, which is Lashonara, that's what Lashonara is, they speak evil. There is a sure sign that they have unforgiveness towards that person. So at the end of the day, it's all because of unforgiveness. And the unforgiveness could have come about by maybe an offense. Maybe the person said something and you took it to heart and you got offended. And now because of the offense, you are harboring something in your heart and therefore you will slander and therefore you will criticize and therefore you will backbite and you will backstab and you will break down. And so he's saying it's not what goes into the mouth, but what comes out of the mouth. So it's these murders, it's adulteries. So at the end of the day, it's when we are in our mind, our will and our emotions. We look at a person lustfully. We want to, to go deeper into things and eventually go into adultery. And then there's whorings. And boy, we have covered whoring intently. When we did the commands, to understand the first command, no, to understand the second command, you shall have no other idols before me. We went into detail on whoring. And thefts. So we will steal and then we bear false witness. We lie, we break down, and then we slander. So we will lie about the person until eventually we slander the person. And these defile the man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. So this is what we've got to understand. Now, if we go look at James chapter 4, let's go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, and we are going to read from verse 1. Where do fightings and strivings come among you? So when people are arguing and fighting and there's strivings among you, do they not come from your pleasure, that battle in your members? So all these fightings and all these squabblings amongst people, it's because of the flesh. It's because of your own members of your flesh. You desire and you do not have. You murder and are jealous and are unable to obtain. You strive and you fight and you do not possess because you do not ask. So we rather break down other people. We rather want what other people want, have. We, we rather jealous of other people as opposed to us being satisfied with where the Father's got us to be and happy with what the Father's given us. You ask and you do not receive because you ask eagerly in order to spend it on your own pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, 
Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with the law? Whoever therefore intends to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of the law. So you see, if you are a friend of the world and you love the things of the world and you are more about the things of the world than being about the things of the Father, then you've got to understand that he calls that adulterers and adulteresses. So an adulterer is also one that is befriending the world because you're fornicating. You become, you're coming into whoredom. So therefore you commit adultery. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? Does the spirit which dwell in us intend, intensely crave unto envy? But he gives greater favor. Because of this, he says, Allure resists the proud, but gives favor to the humble. So then, subject yourselves to Allure. Resist the devil, and he shall flee from you. Draw near to Allure. And he shall draw near to you. Cleanse hands, sinners, and cleanse the hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to dejection. Hubble yourselves in the sight of the Master, and he shall lift you up. Brothers, do not speak against one another. He that speaks against a brother and judges his brother speaks against Torah and judges Torah. And if you judge Torah, you are not a doer of the Torah, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? So let's leave the judging up to the Father and let's allow the Father to be the one to do what he needs to do. Let the Father be the one to be able to bring into the light what he needs to bring into the light so that we may be able to stay, you know, faithful to the Father in serving him and bridle our tongue. Because let's look at James chapter 3 from verses 1 and it says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brother, knowing that we shall receive greater judgment. So everybody wants to be a teacher of the word. But what people do not understand, a teacher of the word has to walk so much more circumspectly. A teacher of the word really needs to be able to walk a tight and narrow path. Because why? Because eyes are on him to see his conduct, whether he's going to be able to uphold the name of Yahuwah. For we all stumble in many matters. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. Also, Able also to bridle the entire body. Look, we put bits in the mouths of horses for them to obey us and we turn their body. Look at the ships too. Although they are so big and are driven by strong winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot intends. So too the tongue is a little member yet boasts greatly. See how a little fire kindles a great forest, and the tongue is a fire. The world of unrighteousness among the members, the tongue is set. The one defiling the entire body and setting on fire the wheel of life, and it is set on fire by Gehinnom. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man is able to tame the tongue. It is unruly. See, that is telling us what our tongue is. This is the tongue that we've got to understand that opens the door to us reaping havoc on our own lives and in the lives of others. Why? Because listen to what it says. But no man is able to tame the tongue. It is unruly evil, filled with deadly poison. With it we bless our Lua and the Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of a Lua. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brothers, this should not be so. So you see, there comes a time that the fear of Yahuwah 
needs to bridle our tongue. And this is the place that I can honestly say more than ever that I am before him and saying, Father, please will you help me to put a coal of fire upon my lips that I will fear you to speak your oracles only. Does the fountain send forth sweet and bitter from the same opening? My brothers, is a fig tree able to bear olives or a grapevine figs? So neither is a fountain able to make salt and sweet water. So this is really where we need to be able to come to the place where we understand that we've got to put a bit in our mouths and we've got to ask the Father to help us to clean up our mouths. So let's look at Matthew chapter 12. We go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, from verses 33 to 36. He says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree rotten and its fruit rotten. Okay, wait, let's just read from verse 31. Because of this I say to you, all sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven men. And whoever speaks a word against the son of Adam, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks a word against the set apart spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree rotten and its fruit rotten, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of adders, brood of vipers, how are you able to speak what is good? Being wicked, for the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. So there we go again. That is when he's saying it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. Because he's seeing every time that these Pharisees open up their mouths, what are they saying? So if you have a good heart, you will speak good things from a good heart. A heart that is pure. That's why the Father says, who are those that may ascend the mountain of Yahuwah? Those with clean hands and a pure heart. So a good man brings forth what is good from the good treasures of his heart. And the wicked man brings forth what is wicked from the the wicked treasure. And I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they shall give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be declared righteous, and by your words you shall be declared unrighteous. So that should really put the fear of Yahuwah in us for us to be able to understand that truly, by our words, we are going to be judged. And by our words, we will be able to give an account. And so I really just keep praying that the Father would bring these words of ours under the blood. Because there's words that when a word gets spoken, you can't take it back. That's why he says you've got to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Quick to listen. That's why the Father gave us two ears to listen, one mouth to speak. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And that's why it had to be, you know, we have different kind of personalities. Not everybody has the same personality. And the personalities that are the ones that are the most difficult personalities are the speaking personalities because these are the things that they come under the greatest judgment under. Because they are a personality that loves to speak. And therefore, their words got to be weighed. And so, those that don't speak a lot are not going to get judged as much. But sometimes they carry it in their hearts. And then when they do speak, even though they don't speak a lot, but when they do speak, it's destruction that comes forth from the wicked heart. Because that's what it says. So if we go look at Ephesians chapter 4.
Ephesians chapter 4 and we're going to read from verses 28 to 31. And it says, Let him who stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, so that he so so that he has somewhat to share with those in need. Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for the use of building up, so as to impart what is pleasant to the hearer. And do not grieve the set apart one. Do not grieve the set apart spirit of Allah, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and displeasure and uproar and slander be put away from you along with all evil. So you see, it comes back to Lashonara, evil speaking, and that is why we are cleansing to understand that the Father is saying that no bitterness, no wrath, no displeasure, no uproar, no slander, none of these are to be able to proceed out of our mouth, that we are to put away the evil from our lives. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 tells us to pursue peace with all and to pursue set apartness, apartness without which no one shall see the master. So if we are not going to cleanse ourselves, if we are not going to set ourselves apart, if we are not going to become tahor, which is what we need to be able to do in order to be able to become clean and set apart, we are not going to be able to see the Father. 1 Peter 3. Powerful scripture this. To sum up, let all of you be like-minded, sympathetic, loving, as brothers, tender-hearted, humble-minded, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this in order to inherit a blessing. So you see, we are not going to fight evil with evil. So if someone does you wrong and someone has to speak wrong about you, you don't have to do the same as them. Who is your judge? Abba Yahu is your judge. If you are going to keep silent and allow them to keep having to do wrong to you, there is a just judge who sees all things and at his time he will bring retribution. For he who wishes to love life and see good days, now this was interesting, he who wishes to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him speak peace and pursue it, because the eyes of Yahuwah are on the righteous and his eyes are open to their prayers. But the face of Yahuwah is against those who do evil. And who is the one doing evil? Do you, do you, um, who is the one doing evil to you? If you become imitators of good, but even if you suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not fear the threats, neither be troubled. But set apart Yahuwah. Allure in your heart and always be ready to give an answer to everyone asking you a reason concerning the expectation that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience so that when they speak against you as doers of evil, those who falsely accuse your good behavior in Messiah shall be ashamed. For it is better, it is the desire of Elua to suffer for doing good than doing evil. Because even Messiah once suffered for sins, the righteous, the righteous of the, for the, un, 
suffered for, this, for, for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to a lure, having been put to death indeed in flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So we have to learn to put to death everything of our flesh so that we may be able to walk in the spirit. And so we also look at the other, um, we also looked at the cleansing of a woman with the issue of blood. And we know that Yeshua in Mark chapter 5, let's go look at Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, and we are going to read from 24 to 34. And he went with him, and a large crowd was following him, and they were thronging him. And a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. Now remember, if a woman had the time of a flow of blood, she would be known to be unclean. Anything that she would touch would be unclean. Any place where a man would come near her in her bed even, he would be unclean. And so if there was an issue of now this was a woman that was suffering from an issue of blood for many years and had suffered much from the physician. So she'd had an issue of blood for 12 years and she had suffered much from many physicians and spent all that she had had and was no better, but rather became worse. Having heard about Yeshua, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. And she said, If I only touch his garments, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And immediately Yahushua, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around to the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his taught one said to him, You see the crowd is thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he was looking around to see who did this. And the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done to her, came and fell down before him and spoke to him all the truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your belief has healed you. Go in peace and he relieved from and he and be relieved from your suffering and affliction. Now you must understand, according to Torah, she I mean many everybody around her would have known that this woman has had an issue of blood. She's been ostracized from the community because remember they would I mean you know, especially the religious Jews in Israel, they still treat women like they are. They want you, They sit on a bus. They want you. They don't want you to sit anywhere near them. When you walk past them, they move aside just in case you might defile them because they're on their way to pray and they don't want to touch any woman. She's not allowed to go near him. That's why the wives don't even sit near them. Near them, they go sit at the back just in case they might be defiled. But praise the Father. As I was reading this, it's interesting that she had an issue of blood for 12 years. Interesting that there are 12 tribes. Interesting that there are, that, um, you know, the 12 tribes of the house of Israel, that the father is already going to be able to bring cleansing to the whole tribe of Israel. Every single tribe will be cleansed. So for every tribe, Generally, there are 12 months in a year. Sometimes we can go into a 13th month, depending on a cycle. But generally, there's 12 months. And the Father has already made sure that he's provided the cleansing for the 12 years that this woman was with her issue of blood. And Yeshua said, power came out from underneath from, from him. Now, understand, straight after this, so he does this miracle of the issue of blood and then straight after this he is going to go 
and he's going to go and pray for a girl that is dead. Now understand, if in the Torah, he came to to basically um, bring, his blood was going to be able to cleanse that which was because he would have been defiled. But she was totally healed. And because she was healed, he was not in the defilement at all. But I'm sure a lot of them there, that's why they, he, he, he just did controversial things. And this woman, straight after this, he went and he healed a, a girl that was dead and he raised her from the dead. And so this is just to see how Yeshua came to be able to bring deliverance to that. And so the half Torah is in Second Kings and we are going to read just a scripture there in Second Kings, um, which is really, um, it's a whole, a whole lot about Elisha, um, that Elisha spoke a word um, of Yahuwah, thus is Yahuwah about this time tomorrow. So the, fa- the um, Elisha has to bring the word of the Father that is bringing this word that's going to come out. And and it's a prophetic word that he's speaking. And he says, And Elisha said, Hear the word of Yahuwah. Thus said Yahuwah, About this time, I see a fine flower for a shekel and two seer of barley for a shekel at the gate of Shamron. And an officer on whose hand the sovereign leaned answered the man of Elua and said, Look, if Yahuwah is making windows in the heavens, Shall this word come true? And he said, look, you are about to see it with your eyes, but not eat of it. So the man of Yahuwah spoke and said to him, you're going to hear of this, but you're not going to eat of it because you are going to land up dying. And exactly what was spoken when we get to the end of the, of the chapter 7 in verse 19 it says that officer answered the man of Elua and said now look if Yahuwah is making windows in the heavens is it according to this word and he has said look you are about to see it with your own eyes but not hear of it and it came to be for him for the people trampled him in the gate and he died so that which the prophet spoke surely came to pass because Elisha words did not get taken back what Elisha spoke by the mouth of the father when the father had spoken through the mouth of Elisha Elisha's words were not going to fall to the ground that which Samuel would speak his words would not fall to the ground because they did not speak in their own esteem they speak by the mouth of the father but yet there are many that will not heed the voice of the prophets, when they are speaking by the mouth of the Father, bringing a warning, bringing a correction, they still do not heed. And then we wonder why then so many people go through so many things in their lives because many times the Father warns himself, many times the Father will send his servants to be able to warn, but the people do not want to listen. And so that is really what we needed to get out of this and the fact that if we have a look, I just wanted to read also in um, Second Kings 7 from verses 9. And it says, and they said to each other, so now these lepers, they were speaking and saying, look, if we're going to stay outside the city, we're going to die because there's a famine. We might as well go into the city and maybe we can find something to eat. So they go to the city that, um, you know, to see that they can at least maybe try and find something to eat there. And when they get there, they see that, there's spoils, there's everything. The, um, that it was ransacked. The Arameans had left the city. They had feared and ran. And now these lepers come in there, four of them, and they are so excited. They got everything for themselves. And so they are just, and when the lepers, we read from verse 8, and when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into the one tent and ate and drank and took of their silver and gold and garments and went out, hid them. And they came back and went into another tent and took, took from there and went and hid it. Then they said to each other, we are not doing right. 
This day is a day of good. This day is a day of good news and we are keeping silent. And if we wait until morning light, then evil shall come upon us. And now, come, let us go and inform the house of the sovereign. Now you see, where is that guilt conscience of many times that we should be able to have the conscience, we should have the discernment to understand, to say, this is not right. But many times I think the conscience becomes seared already and people will just continue to do what they want because they just don't listen to the Father anymore. So we are going to finish off with the scripture in Romans chapter 6 verse 19 to 23. Let us read. Uh, Before we go to Romans, let's just go to Proverbs 6, as I've just, yeah, in Proverbs chapter 6. Let's just first read Proverbs chapter 6, so that we understand that this is the word of the Father. And if he says he hates something, then it's very important. And he says in Proverbs chapter 6, these six matters Yahuwah hates. The seven are an abomination to him. So he hates it and it's an abomination. So you must understand two words that is very critical if we hear the Father speaking. If he says it's an abomination, if he says he hates it, then we really need to take it serious. And he says, and seven are an abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, a hand shedding innocent blood. Oh, I tell you, if that is not what is going on at the moment, innocent blood being shed on both sides. Innocent blood being shed. The father is not into wanting innocent blood shed. He hates it. The hands shedding innocent blood a heart devising wicked schemes, feet quick to run to evil, a false witness breathing out lies, and one who curses, one who causes strife amongst brothers. And isn't there those people that this is what they're very good at doing? Everything was fine in a camp, and then there comes a person to cause strife in a camp. And this is what happens in congregations. This is what happens in fellowships. This is what happens in churches. People go and they cause strife in a congregation, in a setup. Why? Because of the unruly tongue. Because of jealousies. Because of bitterness. Because of unforgiveness. So we are going to finish off with Romans chapter 6. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and we are going to read from verses 16. Do you not know that to whom you spent yourselves servants for obedience, you are servants of one whom you obey, whether of sin or of death, or of obedience to righteousness? But thanks to Elua that you were servants of sin, yet you obeyed the heart that from from teaching to which you were entrusted. So listen to what he says. But thanks to Elua that you were servants, that you were servants of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart. So even though you were servants to sin, you obeyed from the heart that from of that form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And having been set free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. So you become set free. Once you become set free from sin, you then become servants of righteousness. I speak as a man because of the weakness of your flesh. For even as you did present, you did present your members as servants of uncleanness. Remember, we're talking about the Torah of clean and unclean. We're talking about 
this law of clean and unclean. And of lawlessness resulting in lawlessness. So it says, For even as you did present your members as servants of uncleanness and of lawlessness resulting in lawlessness, so now present your members as servants of righteousness. So we are to present ourselves to become servants of righteousness resulting in set-apartness. Because what does the Father want? Be set apart as I'm set apart. Only those, it says, unless you pursue set apartness, you will not see Yahuwah. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit, therefore, were you having then, over which you are now ashamed? For the end thereof is death. But now, having been set free from sin, and having become servants of a law, you have your fruit resulting in set-apartness. So you see, our fruit will result in set-apartness if we are going to be able to pursue Yahuwah. So, but now having been set free from sin, what is sin? Sin is lawlessness. So when we are set free from the lawlessness, then we are becoming servants of a law. And you have the fruit resulting in set-apartness because you are set free from sin, which is your lawlessness. And you have fruit resulting in set-apartness and the end of and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin, the wages of transgressing the Torah, the wages of lawlessness is death. But the favorable gift of a law is everlasting life life in Messiah Yehoshua our master so praise the father this is why we've been set free from the law of sin and death what is sin lawlessness that we no longer transgress Abba Yehoshua's lawless lawlessness we don't we no longer transgress Abba Yehoshua's law so that we may be able to live let us pray Abba Yahuwah, I just want to praise you and I want to thank you for this Torah portion. I thank you, Father, teach us in this hour what it means for us to be able to truly walk in set-apartness and being clean unto you. That we will bridle our tongue. That we will be able to understand that we can be quick to hear but slow to speak. Because when we are slow to speak, then it's not just going to be words bubbling out of our mouths but it's going to be to be spoken in a strategic hour, in a strategic time, in order to be able to bring deliverance and healing. And so, Abba Yahuwah, I just want to thank you for this word. I thank you that it will be a blessing to those who hear it. May you bless your word, Father, in Yeshua's name. Amen.